we welcome you today to our, our uh, opening, our keynote for Hispanic Heritage uh, Celebration at Essex County College. I would like at this time to introduce to, the, to you or bring to the microphone Mr. Edwin Ramirez, the Vice President of the Dominican Student Association, who will introduce our speaker. Edwin. Good morning. Welcome to our Hispanic Heritage Celebration at Essex County College. My name is Edwin Ramirez, and I'm the Vice President of the Dominican Student Association. And I have the privilege to introduce our keynote speaker today. David T. Averroes received his bachelor's at the University of Toronto, his master's at Marquette, at Marquette University, and his PhD from Princeton. Theological Seminary. His articles, his articles have been, have appeared in journals such as the Journal of Religion, Disability and Health, and Harvard Journal of the Hispanic Policy, and the Latino Studies Journal. He published a monograph. He published a monograph at Yale University. And he initiated a new monograph. And he initiated, uh, initiated a new monograph series in the University of San Diego. He published six books, among them, Latinos in the United States, The Sacred and the Political, new University of Notre Dame's Press, 2006. I'm sorry, I was supposed to do that. Um, the Latino Family and Politics of Transformation. Strategies of Transformation Towards the Multicultural Society, The Latino Male, A Radical Definition, and he is the editor of a book authored by Professor Manford Helpman, Transforming the Personal, Political, Historical, and Sacred Faces of Our Being in the Theory and Practice. He taught at Senior Hall University, Yale University as a, as a visiting professor in the politics department, Princeton, Princeton University as a visiting professor on numerous occasions from 1981 to 2002, and returned to Princeton full time from 2006 to 2009. He was selected he was selected New Jersey Professor of the Year from 1987 to 1988, and was a and was a and was the recipient was the um, recipient of National Gold of the National Gold Medal as one of the top ten university professors in the nation. Professor Avalos' goal throughout the teaching throughout his teaching career has been to develop personal and political strategies to address to address the needs in the marginalized communities in the areas of education and healthcare. Currently, he is working on, he is working with Princeton Healthcare System as a local, organ, as a local organization to provide, to provide healthcare services for his local community. For the past 12 years, he has worked with he has worked with the EWRSD to develop strategies to meet the education needs of the, of the immigrant and Latino communities. Um, as you know, my address this morning is titled Empowering Students from the Classroom, from the College Classroom to the Barrio. The most important civil rights issue of the 21st century for la comunidad latina is education. And for all people of color and for all incoming immigrants, the most important way to climb the ladder to success in the United States is education. And I think pretty much most of you know this. Now, one of the most important things that all of us have to be able to do is to tell our stories and to take our journey through the core drama of transformation and I have a symbol here that you may not be able to see very well, but what I'm talking about here is that every one of us is on a journey. 
My parents, for example, came from Mexico. That's, and then my journey began in Detroit, Michigan, in La Comunidad Mexicana, in the Mexican community. And my father worked at Ford Motor Company. And he was an immigrant. And he was uneducated. And he was poor. And that's one of the reasons why he was shot by a police officer. And my mother still had the bullet. And she showed me this bullet. And so I always knew that I came from a background of struggle. And I also knew that I needed to struggle. Growing up in Detroit, we were surrounded by people who didn't like us. Dirty Mexican, go back to Mexico. Go back where you came from. I, I said to them, look, I was born in this country. And so were the Irish. They at one time were the dirty Irish and the dirty Italians and the dirty Jews. You all came out this way as well. And when you got here, you were also discriminated against. So don't forget your history. So every group that comes into the country turns around and knocks the other one in the head once they already begin to make it. The important thing for all of us is to recognize that we are all in this together and that we are connected to each other. All right? Now, I wanted to make a few comments about how the stories that we live are what I consider to be sacred stories. Right? Now, by sacred stories, I mean that people like you and me, in our culture, we are, from the very beginning, our first parents, our first teachers are our parents. We learn the stories of how to survive in this country, and we learn the stories of our parents of how they survive in La Republica Dominicana, or Ecuador, or Mexico, or Cuba, wherever we came from. Right? Or if you came from Ireland, or if you came from the Caribbean, wherever you came from, those are the stories that were brought. Now, two of the stories that are very important that all of us learned were patriarchy and matriarchy. And the problem with patriarchy is that my father always dominated my mother. So that when my father died, my mother didn't know what to do because she had become so dependent only on my father because he made all the decisions. And then my mother turned around and she became a matriarch, which means she said, en mi casa solamente mando yo, which means that she now took the place of my father. But the problem is with our families is that we all need to find out who we are. And so we were surrounded with Sin and shame and guilt, right? Malcriado, okay? No tienes vergüenza. And so as soon as I would hear those words, I would get, you know, immediately afraid because I didn't want to be a sin vergüenza or a malcriado. So my mother always knew that she could use the trinity of repression, sin and shame and guilt, in order to keep me quiet and my brothers and sisters quiet. So then in this country, we knew that there was a whole other culture, a whole other bunch of stories out there that we needed to learn to survive. And one of those stories was the stories of individualism and of capitalism. And I don't have much use for individualism because the individualist libertarian says, look, I am the only one who counts. It's only me. I'm going to get ahead. Doesn't matter if anybody else gets ahead in the community. I am the one who is the most important. And in addition to that, capitalism is only interested in one thing, and that is money and power and domination. Money, power, and domination could care less about any sense of justice or compassion for other people. And you see all the fights that are going on now in the Congress, and all the fights over Obamacare. You've got all these old white men who are trying to hold back all of the communities of color who are coming into the country. And they already now know that by the year 2050, there are going to be over 100 million Latinos, only Latinos in the United States. And then together with other communities of color, we're going to be the majority. They don't want that to happen. And so they're doing everything that they can to prevent history, to prevent people from being able to move, to get ahead to be able to get an education, to be able to get health care, 
to be able to get the services that they need in order to survive. So that again, my mother always used to say to me, mi casa solamente se habla español. In my home, you only speak Spanish. But I knew out there, I had to learn English. And so luckily, I learned to become bilingual. But what a lot of us did is we assimilated. And some of you are in danger of assimilating. And do you know what assimilation means? It means hatred of your own background. Because assimilation comes from the term, the term in Latin, similo similare, which means to become like others. What others? All those other people, the powerful, the rich, the wealthy. I want to be like them. And I remember growing up in Detroit, and all of the Irish boys, the Mahoney's and the Quinn's and the Merritt's, the Kelly's, they were always trying to beat me up. Yeah? And I looked around and I saw these guys. And I thought to myself, I'm as good as they are. But I always had to prove myself. And one of the ways that we used to prove ourselves, unfortunately, sometimes was you had to use your fist. But then I realized, no, the fist is not the issue. The issue is here, inside of me. I've got to discover that there's something in me that will allow me to become a better human being. And I want to mention something. I remember when I was doing some work, I was writing some papers. And I kept trying to figure out, what does this teacher want me to say? Because obviously you want to please the powerful, you want to please the teacher. And I kept trying to write the essays in such a way that I knew that she would you know, like what I had to say. And I kept getting C's. And I thought to myself, no, this can't be right. And then finally I, I thought to myself, wait a minute. I've got something inside of me that wants to come out. And then what I began to do was to write from the inside out. And as I did that, I began to discover that there was a mystery inside of me that nobody else had given me. Right? I didn't copy anything. Right? I didn't look at anybody's papers. Nobody else helped me. I found it within myself, and when I began to do that, then I knew that there was something in me that nobody else could take away. That was the empowerment that I, that I first of all, began to feel. And then when I went to college, I didn't think I'd be able to make it. Because all the people ahead of me had all done all kinds of had heads of their student council. I graduated with honors, etc., and I came in there. My mother never went to school. My father never went to school. None of my brothers and sisters, you know, grad, well, two of them graduated from high school. None of them went to college. So what was I doing? I was making history, as you are making history, because you're the first ones in your family to be able to come to college and to be able to learn all kinds of math and science and physics, whatever it is, you're now moving ahead. So that's why when I think about this, and I think about the Chicano students, and, and the word Chicano is a word for Mexican-American, but they're militant Mexican-Americans at Princeton. And I had a group of students at Princeton in 1985. There were two sophomores and three fresh freshmen. And when they got to Princeton, they said, look, yes, we're glad we came to Princeton. And we're glad that you began to recruit Latino students in the 1970s. But wait a minute, when we look around, what you're really asking us to do is to become quite upper middle class students. And we don't want to be that. We want to remain Mexican. We want to remain Chicano. We want to remain somebody who's rooted in our own heritage and background. And so then what they began to say basically was the following. My personal face is something that you don't accept and you want me to assimilate. You want me to make it white. And how do you know this? Because all the professors, all of the courses, all of the administrators are white. And nobody looks like us. There are no courses about us. And then in addition to that, they realize, hey, wait a minute. To be political is not only every two or four years to vote for somebody, no. To be political is of the very nature of our humanity, that we are always political. And so the students said, wait a minute, you know, because you reject our personal faces, what we're going to do is become political. We're going to change this environment. 
And so what they did is they, the five of them, they started a study, the status of Latinos at Princeton. And they went up and down and looked at all the curriculum, they looked at all the faculty, they looked at all the administrators, and even the people who were doing, you know, the, the uh, services, the maintenance, etc. And they showed how zero, 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 when they looked at Latinos, they looked at Latinas, zero, zero, zero everywhere. And then they said, well, let's do something about this. What we're going to do is ask the chairpersons of the various departments to start to look for faculty who come from the Latino background, especially Puerto Rican, and especially Mexican, because those are the two main Latino groups at the time at Princeton. And so, again, what they were doing was changing their environments. And they created the first course at Princeton, the first permanent course at Princeton, which dealt with Latinos in the United States, and that was Latino politics in the United States, and I was the first faculty member to teach it. I was so proud to do that. Coming out of my own heritage, recognizing what we had gone through, and now here with these students at one of the most powerful universities in the country stating that we need courses and faculty who honor and respect our background. And so therefore, what did they do? They created history, as you created history. Because for the first time, never before had there been a course about our communities at Princeton University, and now there was. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll take it further in a little while. And then the point being is that history is not just looking at the past and repeating the past. History means you create new turning points. New turning points, that's what history is about. And then all of this has to do with what? Each of us and each of you here that also has a sacred face. That each of us is another face of God. Right? So if you take these four faces of our being, the personal face, there's nobody else like me, nobody else like you. You are unique. You need to be able to discover your mystery and your stories. Right? In addition to that, we each have a political face. That each of us has the right to be able to change our environment. And so, for example, I have some ideas as to what you can do in the community to change the environment, because why? The environment presently excludes many people. And then with our historical face, we create new turning points, new stories, because all of this comes from what? The sacred face of our being. Now, when it comes also to the sacred, you know, there's a lot of people who talk about God, Yahweh, talk about, you know, Allah, talk about Buddha. And my main concern is to recognize the God of transformation. And by the God of transformation, I mean the following. There are some people who say, oh, Dios mío, oh, I could never, you know, do anything differently. And that's a God that kind of like makes you feel exactly sin, shame, guilt. You can't do anything, you know? And then there's another God that says that life is only about power. And so I look at that, I, and I think to myself that this is a capitalistic God. And then there are other people who believe that they're superior to other people because they have God on their side, and therefore they can hurt you. That can't possibly be what God is about. Why? Because the only God I believe in is the God of transformation. The God who says that each of us is valuable, that each of us has the right to be able to continue on the journey of transformation until they achieve their selfhood, and then we become guides for others. Okay. Now, I'm going to return again to the story of assimilation that I started with, too. Assimilation then means, as I said, you like to become like the others. And then part of the, the drama of assimilation, besides becoming like others, is filled with self-hatred. Because you look at your background, you say, oh, no, no, I, I, I have no tortillas in my lunch anymore, Mom. I don't want to be like that. I want to be accepted. I want to be like them. And so what you start to do is to fit in. And then one day, you wake up and you say to yourself, wait a minute, you know, something's wrong here. Like the students at Princeton. There's nobody else here like us. And then people say, oh, you know, David, you know, look at you, you know, now you become a troublemaker. And then they'll be gone to exile us. 
And for example, when I was at Seton Hall University with Don Gidmian, you know, one of your professors here, years ago, we began to protest the war in Vietnam. And then what they'll do is because you step out of line and you're not being a good Mexicano or a good Latino or a good African American or whatever, what they'll say to you is, look, we don't really want you here, and so they exile you. You don't get promotion, you don't get tenure, you know, you, you get moved out of your office, whatever. So the powerful always know how to punish us. Right? And so then again, you wake up one day and you say to yourself, okay, I don't want to be exiled. And so the next thing that happens to us is that it happened to the American Indians is that the worst thing you can do to people who refuse to be assimilated is you can kill them. As we know, the American Indians were killed. There was a policy of genocide right from the very beginning of this country. Right? And so when you look again at the story of assimilation, don't buy that story. So what I'm really talking about is acculturation. Acculturation means I can take my Caribbean background from Jamaica. You know, I can take my background from Cuba, from the Dominican Republic, from Mexico, or from wherever you come, and say to myself, this is good. I need to discover some other aspects to this, which are some are negative, but to discover the positive in my background and to hang on to that, and then to take on the best of American culture. And the best of American culture is democracy. Why? Because I think that there's a basic struggle that's going on in this country between the two stories of capitalism and democracy. They're not the same. Because again, as I mentioned, capitalism is based on power and domination and exclusion. On the other hand, democracy believes that each one of us is valuable. Each one of us needs to participate. So that's a contradiction, because the powerful don't want us to participate. The powerful don't want us to be involved. They want to be able to dominate us. And so I think that that is the struggle taking place for the soul of this country. And so as students, when you start to think to yourself, OK, I want to make it in this country. Yes, I want to make it also. But do it in such a way that what you do is you honor the background from which you come and honor the students who are around you. In other words, honor community. Right? Okay. A couple other points I wanted to make are these. And that is that many of us in this assembly this morning, including myself, we started with some pretty difficult baggage. We also experienced the story of what I call the wound itself. And by the wound itself, I mean the following. First of all, that almost all the students I've taught at Yale and Princeton, and I also taught for a while, I believe, at uh, Wheat Creek High School, and I taught high school in Detroit, I taught high school in Canada, and everywhere I taught, I always urged the students to tell your story. Because a lot of us have certain aspects of our lives that are hidden, that we don't want to reveal to anybody because we're afraid. And why are we afraid? Because we live in a, in a society which is based on competition for power. And if we, just, if we show our wounds, if we show our weaknesses, they'll say, well, you know, I'll, I'll be hurt. So let me give you an idea then as to what the wound itself is about. Many of us suffered from physical abuse. Many of us suffered from psychological abuse. Many of us suffered from sexual abuse. Many of us suffered from alcohol and drug abuse and the wound of being abandoned. Right? And so those are the wounds that we walk around with. What would we need to hide them? And this is why a lot of us play games and why a lot of us joke around about things because deep down there's this aspect to ourselves that we feel is going to continue to drag us down. And then you wake up one day and you realize, well, wait a minute, you know, I can't do anything about what was done to me. All I can do now is to deal with what I have now and go forward with that and to be able to, to free myself and to heal myself together with other people. 
And one of the best ways to do this is to tell your story to somebody else. I have to tell you very honestly, as a child, I was sexually abused right, by a Boy Scout who lived next door to me. And you know, you feel just terrible. You don't know what to do because I was just a little kid. Right? And in the same way also, there were times when I was physically abused because in the neighborhood in which I grew up, you got hit a lot. And you never knew when you went out the door what was gonna to happen to you. So we lived in danger. And so in the midst of all this stuff, somehow or other, I became not angry all the time. There was some anger there, but I became strong. So if I can get through this, I can deal with anything. I can deal with classes at Essex County. I can deal with classes at Princeton. I can deal with classes anywhere. Why? Because I've had the worst that's been thrown at me. And in the same way also, many of you, the worst has been thrown at you. And one of the things that I think helps us to get out of this kind of a situation, as I mentioned, is being able to tell your story, to trust somebody, to tell them, look, I, I just want to tell you that, you know, if you really care about me, if you love me, I want you to know my story. And one of the, the novels that I, I, I've sometimes taught whole courses with novels. And one of them was All Quiet on the Western Front by Eric Maria Remark, which is the story of young German soldiers who were whipped into a frenzy of nationalism. And they all joined as students that joined the army because they were going to go off to this wonderful, marvelous, you know, task of, of enhancing Germany. And then they soon found out the first person that was killed, the first person that lost their leg, that this was no joke. And then there was one key man, young man in the novel, who has a relationship to Kaczynski. And the two of them developed this incredible relationship. One of them is 20 years old, and the other is 40 years old. And what happened between them was the, was the story of intimacy. And the story of intimacy means that for the first time, I can feel close to myself because this person cares about me. This person really does know who I am and really loves me. And so they talk about the fact that the two of them, you know, were facing battle together. And out of all that, again, that experience, they came to recognize the closeness that was between them. Now, why is that also important? Because a lot of us suffer from what I call internalized oppression. And internalized oppression means that a lot of us began to believe the lies that were told about us. We began to believe that Latinos were lazy. We began to believe you know, that somehow the Latinos were dumb. We began to believe that African Americans you know, were always, you know, you know, again, dumb, that they couldn't learn. And so we began to believe all these kinds of lies, and then after a while you begin to, to realize that, you know, you have become part of the enemy because you're accusing yourself and your own people of being weak and of being defective. Now, I just wanted to take a couple of novels and show how some of this was dealt with. A lot of you may have read One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest with Ken Kesey. And the main character in that novel is really the big chief. The big chief is like a student. A lot of you are underground. I was underground. And what I mean by underground, I meant that I was kind of like surviving. And I didn't really want to know too much about anybody or know, someone know about me. And then he kind of felt when McMurphy came to the ward, because in the ward also is He's like a synonym of American society, right? There were some locals, some crazy people, and there were some other people who were not as crazy. And there were some people who knew exactly what was going on, and one of them was the big chief. And what he said to himself when McMurphy came, he said, you know, I'm thinking now that what I'm, what I'm gonna do is drop out. And what he meant by that is I'm gonna drop out for good. 
I'm going to go underneath the fog and nobody will ever find me again. I'll go crazy or whatever it may be, but nobody will ever reach me. But then McMurphy got to him. And for the first time after 18 years, he began to speak. He discovered his, his, he's huge, but he kept thinking that he was just this little man. And the reason why he was so small was because he believed what other people said about him, that he was just this big, dumb Indian. And then what he does, as I think many of you know, at the end, he grabs this, this fountain, this water contraption that's used, and he pulls it up from the ground, busts all the pipes. That's a symbol of the system. And he takes it and throws it through the windows and runs out and escapes. That's the system. And in the same way also, in La Carreta, by Rene Marquez, right, the story of Luis, and how Luis is always looking for those travels. He wants to make money. And so he says, I want to go to the United States. And I think a lot of you know that Operation Bootstrap was begun by the United States in order to alleviate some of the difficulties in terms of population and also in terms of no jobs, of being able to take a lot of people and get them to come to the United States. And it was like they would give them one-way tickets for $45 to New York. So Luis and his sister and his, and his mother came to New York. And then when he got here, he realized that, you know, that, you know, peyon allá, peyon acá. I was a peon over there, and I'm a peon here. There's no difference. So, but in addition to that, he experienced the racism, the discrimination. And then finally, what happens to him is on the job in La Máquina del Trago. One of the machines actually consumed him, and that to me is a symbol of the system. That the system will consume us and destroy us once we begin to believe that it has all the power. And then Juanita, who is a sister, and the mother, they decide, hey, wait a minute, General, we're going back to Puerto Rico. Now, this doesn't mean the Puerto Ricans are going to leave here and go back. What they're really talking about is, y un diré mis manos en la tierra colorada. And I will take my hands and I will bury them in the red earth. And you know where the red earth is? It's inside of us. So we carry Puerto Rico with us. We carry the African nations within us. We carry the Caribbean nations within us. We carry the Latino nations within us. We are those nations. We are the people. Now, another one is the color purple. Many of you read The Color Purple by Alice Walker. And Celie, she wakes up one day, and she goes from rebellion to transformation. Let me show the difference. Rebellion is an act of resistance in which you hit back against somebody. But if you're a rebel, it means that, you are con that you're controlled by the consciousness of the oppressor. And so sometimes what we'll do is we'll do something to that person that they did to us. But what, what's this change? Nothing changed. The main thing is, in terms of changing your life, is to create an alternative which is new and better. That's the key. Because what good does it do for me to be angry all the time with my mother, and my father, and my brothers, and my sisters, and my neighbors, whoever, and I fight against them my whole life, and then realize that I've spent all my energy just fighting, but I didn't create anything else. The key thing is not rebellion, it's transformation. The creation of something fundamentally new and better in your life. And that's one of the reasons why being here at Essex County, getting an education, becoming conscious, becoming aware of what it is that you're doing. Another novel I want to mention is Too Late the Fellow Road by Alan Payton. And this is a novel about a white family, the Van Vlaanderen family, in South Africa. And as you know, in South Africa, ever since the Dutch got there in the 17th century, they basically enslaved the black population. And one of the persons who's caught in all this is a young lieutenant named Peter. And Peter falls and is sexually attracted towards a black woman. And he's shocked. 
He says, how can this be? How could I, he was a, he was a national uh, soccer hero, and he was also this hero who came back from the Second World War, and he's also a lieutenant in the army or in the, the police force, and he's attracted to a black woman, and he said, this doesn't make any sense. He has a beautiful wife, two kids, the whole thing, but he has this attraction, and he's trying to figure out why. And so as the novel goes on, we start to find out. And that is that what had happened is that his father um, um, invited him to go look for the fellow, which is a bird, a famous bird in South Africa. And he says to Peter, look, Peter, there, there, there's the fellow, because it's very difficult to, to find these birds. And Peter is looking and looking, and his father comes up and touches him and puts his hand on him and says, Look, it's right over there. And Peter was stunned, and he started to cry. And his father thought, he thought, I, I can't let my father see me cry. And so he hid it, and then you start to realize that one of the reasons why he could not deal with affection, he could not deal with his father touching him, was because his father, who was a racist, an out and out racist, always felt you could never show any weakness in the face of the black community. Because if you did, they would turn on you. They would overpower you. And so in order to keep this world of repression, keep this world of, of domination based on color, he basically was being raised not to deal with his feelings, not to deal with his sexuality, not to deal with himself. And at the end, it ends tragically because Peter is caught, because somebody you know, reported him, and he's exiled. And we don't know what's going to happen to him. And in a sense, the, the point that Alan Payton was making is, we don't know where South Africa is going. But then we do know that what did happen was the emergence of the great you know, leader. OK, a couple, just a couple more here, like water for chocolate. Some of you may have read like water for chocolate, and about Tita and about how Tita was dominated by her mother, slapped around by her mother. And so finally what she does is she rebels against her mother and just doesn't rebel. She lets that whole matriarchal story, she just lets it go. But one transformation is not enough because then she turns around and she gets involved in a relationship with a young man. And when he dies, she wants to die. Because she says, my life is useless without him. And then when you really think of it for a minute, wait a minute. Yes, this person was important in my life, but I need to go on because of the strength and the love that they gave me. I can't die. But in the end, she commits suicide. No answer you know, for, for that. Now, just one last one. Siddhartha. And that is that the whole journey of Siddhartha is never to find a leader where someone is going to tell you what to do. You need to become your own Buddha. You need to become your own Christ. You need to become your own Mohammed. You need to become your own Moses. And that's what, again, it means for you to recognize that the strength and the power and the creativity and the mystery is in each of us. The question is, is to discover it. And then the last one I wanted to mention is The Grapes of Wrath. And some of you may have read again The Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck, telling the story of all of white people and of how they lost total confidence in the American dream. And they got up and they had to leave because all their land was being taken away from them because of the drought. And the drought that came, they couldn't join in the, the winds that came. Day after day after day blew away all the topsoil. And they were all sharecroppers, so they couldn't you know, pay their rent, pay their mortgage, or have what is, you know, pay for the crops. And then, so they all got in these old jalopsies and then went on their way to California. And on the journey to California, they discovered their strength. And especially Casey. Casey was a preacher, and he says to, uh, to the young, young Tom Joe, he says, 
I'm not, not a preacher anymore. I don't know what to say. I lost the spirit. But on the journey, he rediscovered the spirit in doing what? In struggling for the people. That's where he just rediscovered the spirit. Now, I want to now say a little bit about, just as the students at Princeton, each of you, your organizations, can do something in your own neighborhoods here in Essex County, right? Because why? Because as I mentioned, you're political. Taking the students a little bit further, they met with President Bowman, the president of Princeton. They gave him all the results of their study, and he was amazed by it. So he said to them, I promise you I'll begin to do something about this. And as a result of that, there are courses and teachers at Princeton that were never there before. And in addition to that, there was a follow-up to this study that was done in 2008 to show how far they had gone and how much they still had to go. So it's ongoing. They made history. Here are these two sophomores and three freshmen who helped to create a whole new history of Princeton. And who would have thought that? Because you would think that you get to Harvard, Princeton, Yale, oh, you're so overwhelmed. You know, ah, I'm at Yale. You know, oh, I'm at Princeton. And so Princeton takes you over. And you belong to Princeton. Princeton doesn't belong to you. Now, what I'd like to recommend is the following. To organize a parents group in your local school district. To hold a series of seminars in your local school or church or library. The rights of workers. The rights of tenants. How the courts work. The relationship with the local police. Access to health care. ESL and GED. Preparing your taxes domestic violence, access to legal services, a course on the internet and computers, acquiring social services, the rights of the undocumented. I have to mention to you that right now, we're locked in a battle where I live uh, locally, in which we had a superintendent who knew all the people that he was letting in were undocumented. And so what he would do is say to them, okay, I'm like, I'll give you an apartment, and I'll even let you have two or three extra people, which is overcrowding and illegal, if you give me a cut. So they began to give him a cut so that they could have a person extra who would live there, help to pay the rent, but then he was then taking in the money. If you lost your key, $35. In the lease, you only pay $5, but nobody could read the lease. It was all in English, right? In addition to that, people began to realize, hey, wait a minute, something happened to my jewelry. Something happened you know, to the money that I had here. 40 to 50 apartments were broken into. No forced entry had to be a key. So all this stuff, that, and why no one came forward, why? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm undocumented, terrified. This went on for years. And finally, some of them said, we can't go on like this anymore. We need to stand up and fight for our rights. And then they met with the mayor and the police director. And he said, they both said to them, look, if you're the victim of a crime, undocumented or not, you have the right to re report this and none of the immigration people will become involved. The same thing also when they were working, a lot of the people work, and then they come to get their paycheck, the perfect guy says, well, I'm sorry. I, I've heard that you're undocumented, so I'm not going to pay you. So they don't pay them. But they don't realize that according to the New Jersey State Department of Labor and the United States Department of Labor, it doesn't matter if you're an American or undocumented or whatever, you have the right to your paycheck. But again, they don't know their rights. Simple things like being able to have access to health care, especially if, if you have children born in this country. Right? They have rights because they're American citizens, and so do the parents. And what we do is we have a health, a health fair. Everybody comes. It doesn't matter from what background. They have eye exams. 
They have breast cancer exams. They have uh, prostate cancer exams. Take your cholesterol level. They do hearing aid. Your hearing tests or everything like that. So there's no, it doesn't cost anything. So this is the kind of thing. This is the empowerment of yourselves, not only here at Essex County, because you're getting the education which is going to allow you the leverage in the wider society, but also to empower you in terms of what you do in the community. There's none of us who doesn't have that ability to be able to do it. What we did also is we took high school students and we said to them, look, take these little kids and teach them English. Teach them reading and writing. Right? And so that's what they began to do. So again, there's, there's no end to the kinds of, of things that, uh, that can be done. Now, finally, I want to leave you with this kind of personal political, historical, and sacred you know, meditation. Our journey takes us to the center of ourselves as co-creators of the expanding universe with God. Right? Our goal is to be at home in the universe. Our bodies carry within them all of the elements of the periodic table that derive from the dust of exploding stars. We came from within the cosmos, destined to be that part of creation that would be the consciousness of the universe reflecting upon itself. When you think about it, all of the animal kingdom, all of the plant kingdom, none of it is conscious. Only us as human beings. Our vocation then is to be fully human and therefore responsible for one another and for our mother earth. We are all of us together with plant life and animal life as well as the air we breathe, the fire that warms us, the water that cleanses us, and the earth that embraces us, we are all interconnected. All of creation is called upon to participate together with God in the ongoing evolution of the cosmos. But we as humans who have become conscious have a more delicate and crucial vocation to become as gods, each of us necessary as co-creators with God. And then finally, we carry the universe and God within us and are urged forward by a transcendent spirit to transform the dark matter of the unknown and to give shape to the coming not yet universe. From the depths of the cosmos to the inner depths of the oceans, to the inner mystery within each of us, we are microcosms that parallel the great microcosm of the evolving universe. It is the exploding creative energy within each of us as co-creators that expands the universe. We experience in our own lives the creative chaos of the rhythm of the universe, create, nourish, and destroy in order to create anew. So that's the message that I wanted to, to share with you this morning. And again, above all, to come back to my own experience and my own journey and the fact that each of you is on a similar journey and that when you come to the end of your journey, you come to recognize the sacredness within yourself. And then you can become guides for others. Not leaders, not people who dominate, but people who can then guide other people to their what? To the mystery within themselves, okay? So, muchísimas gracias y que viva la raza. Transformation has to begin with ourselves. And if I take again, go back to the story of patriarchy that I mentioned, that I think really was a disservice 
and is still at the service in all traditional cultures, is the domination of the male, which leads, I think, to uh, a dependency on the part of women, a belief on the part of women that they're not as intelligent, a, part, a belief on the part of women that they, they're not capable, they're not able to do something. And also there's a lot of domestic violence that comes out of this because if you question a male in a patriarchal society, you're in trouble. Not only as a son or a daughter, but also as, as a wife. Now, that story of patriarchy was something when I grew up, I began to look at it and say, hey, you know, I, that's not gonna be a part of my life. I went to the University of Toronto. I went to, I went to t teach high school. I've interacted with a lot of other people, etc. Nah, I'm beyond that. Then I got married and I woke up one day that I was just like my father. And I was shocked. And that's because a lot of us believe that transformation is intellectual. And it's not intellectual, it's in here, in our deepest depths. And so we need to know how to get rid of a story like that if it's this one, or if it, I mentioned earlier, if it's a story of tribalism, if it's a story of racism, whatever stories they are, we always have to make sure that we have not been infected and wake up one day and realize, hey, I've got some racism inside of me, and I didn't know that. In Latin America, for example, there is rampant racism between the, the white upper Spanish-oriented group that's been there since the conquest, still there today. Right? So what do we do with those stories when we wake up one day and realize that it's still in me? So I began, first of all, to talk to my wife about this, because she's a Mexican woman. She's also a lawyer. She's also a vice president at the University of Medicine and Dentistry. So you're not immune from these things just because you have degrees, right? just because you have positions. It's the stories that we carry within us that we need them to deal with and say, I don't want the next generation to be hampered and hurt by these stories. And so you begin to work on it. And you talk about it and say, no, we don't want to continue the story. I do not want to be dependent. I do not want to dominate don't want to control, have to let it go, let it go. And in the, in the novel Ceremony, right, Tayo is a young man who's vomiting all the time, vomiting. We say, ooh, why, why is he always vomiting? He was trying to vomit out the poison that he had been taught that he was not as, as good as the whites because he was an American Indian. And then he finally realized at the end and he cries, he now knows that he is who he is and he, need, he wants to accept that. And so in a similar way, when Sally and I were working all this kind of stuff out, we went through a lot of struggle to get rid of it, to vomit it, to get, it, to get it out of our system, to free ourselves from it in order to do what? To create a new and better marriage. And so the same thing also when it comes to the story of racism person wakes up one day and realizes, oh my God, like, I didn't realize I was a racist. And sometimes people of color can be racist against other groups, right? Or you can be against a Muslim. For what reason? Oh, well, you know, they're all terrorists. That's a stereotype. They're not all terrorists. Nobody is all terrorists. And so that again, we need to identify and isolate the story that, that, that wounded us and say to ourselves, I need to do whatever is necessary to get rid of that story. And one of the ways to do that is to establish a relationship with a real Muslim, right? And to say, oh my God, look, here's a real, I met this person who was Muslim, and all the stereotypes fell away because now I recognize that he or she are real human beings like me. And so you have a meal together, you do whatever is necessary to undermine and to attack. And then again, as I said, not just to rebel, which is to, to say, I don't want to be like that, but I want to create something as an alternative. And the alternative is, is that you create a relationship, a friendship, 
a relationship of intimacy. And by intimacy here, I mean that you become close to somebody else of a from a different background. And then you recognize, oh my God, like, what happened to me? How did that happen? And you don't want it ever to happen again with your own children. That's how we come, become aware of this. Okay? All these kinds of interactions, these kinds of relationships, those are sacred stories. We need to get rid of the ones that are, that are destructive and create alternatives. Like there's all kinds of stuff like creating the story of the, uh, the Latino male as a political innovator. Because the male is always looked upon as being a dominator. No, the male is also an innovator, creates something new. The same thing with women. Right? That they also can create something new. And one, now that one other novel I was just thinking about was the water, uh, Woman Hollering Creek, in which Clophilus goes from being a Yorona, you know, crybaby, you know, you know how they're Yoros, and she goes from being a Yorona to becoming a Gritona. She shouts with joy that she finally was able to get away from a husband who dominated her and controlled her into the realization that she is a woman and that she's free. Beautiful stories. And then when you read those novels, you can identify with the characters and say, oh my God, this person is telling my story. Right? That's why you read good novels. That's why you read poetry. That's why you read plays. Because it's telling our stories, looking at them, identifying the, the stories that are destructive, and then looking to see what other ones can be created. And in Malcolm X, Malcolm X believed that he was, because you know, the whites were so bad, he began to believe that somehow that he was superior. And then as a result of his being re related to Muhammad, uh, to, to his, uh, the teacher that he had, he, he broke with him, especially when he went to Mecca. Because when he went to Mecca, he went through what? A transformation. And he looked, when he got to Mecca, he looked and he saw there were blonde women with blue eyes, and they're Muslim. And he was shocked, because he thought what? All white people were devils. And now he realizes, no, we can't live life like that. We have to be able to be open to whatever the way people treat us. Right? So that, again, what we do is look at the way we were raised, look at our stories, and then say, what can I do, which, which allows me to get away from those stories which are destructive and to create something fundamentally new and better. Four kinds of students, four kinds of teachers. There are some students who never question anything. You know, I remember when I was in high school, we used to call them suck holes. Because every, every time the teacher would say something, they agreed with everything. And that to me is a kind of education which I call seduco, which means that the teacher seduces you into believing that they have all the truth. And then there are other students who practice education called reduco. They reduce everything to the pursuit of self-interest and power. And that's what life, that's the only reason I'm here. Hey, don't tell me about thinking and consciousness. No, I, I just want to know, how am I going to get a better job? How am I going to make some money? How am I going to get power? And that's okay, but at the same time, there is this other side. And then the worst kind of education, and the worst teachers are the ones who practice, they do go, they deduct something from your humanity. Because you're gay in a classroom, you're humiliated. Because you're a woman in a math class that's usually dominated by white males, you're humiliated. Because you're a person of color, they never call on you. So there is that kind of deformation that goes on. The only kind of education that I know is educo, educo, which comes from the Latin, to take somebody and lead them out of themselves with their own creativity. Whereas seduco is all the creativity is in the teacher. And I'm loyal to that teacher. The reduco is nothing with mysteries, only about power. Or deduco meaning that you're not valuable at all unless you belong to the powerful. So educo means again and again, the teachers who guide you to yourself, 
guide you to yourself. That's where the mystery is, is within you. So when you come to math or biology or whatever it is, get into it. If you find a teacher who loves math, you'll begin to, to learn something from it. But if they're just up there, mm, they would kill it. Right? People who love what they do will guide you into a whole new universe of discourse and help you to see the mystery of it. You know, all of this, this is what I think the best education is about. The question was, the statement is, uh, dis discrimination on the basis of religion. Right? Uh, I was raised a Roman Catholic, and I know some of you were raised as various Protestant traditions, some of you may have been raised as Muslim, whatever it is that you're raised as. The sacred and religion means that it leads you into a whole realm of a relationship, not only with God, but also with your fellow human beings, regardless of what background you come from. And so therefore, to tell somebody I'm going to kill you in the name of Allah is absolute madness. To kill somebody in the name of Jesus is madness. To kill somebody in the name of Moses is madness. Because again, all of those religious heritages and tradition began as a journey to what? To freedom and liberty. Yeah. All of them did. Leading us into a whole new world of a new relationship with God, a new relationship with each other, and also with the world. And therefore, if anybody then says, oh, I have the only truth, that makes it possible for me to hurt you because you're disagreeing with me. You're a heretic. And, and so again, I sometimes look at religion and I say, oh my God, like, you know, I don't even want to be a Catholic anymore because of some of the things that Catholics do. And so I'm growing my own Catholicism. You, you learn and you, you learn there are certain aspects of the tradition which are harmful and you let those go. Like for example, the scandal that's taking place between uh, you know, the priests who, who hurt children and because we, again, patriarchal, hierarchical structure, the bishops at the top and the cardinals at the top, they protect these little boys down here who are the priests. If they get into trouble, they want to make sure you know, that uh, we protect them, rather than protecting the real children in the society around them. So they lost their way. And again, I, I don't believe in this huge hierarchical churches of any kind. The question is, is that each of us is, again, as I said, sacred. And therefore, I don't, you know, sometimes when we go to church and we go to mass and they put up a host and they're like, uh, I, I don't want to be disrespectful, but I say, oh my God, stop that. Why? I should bow down in front of you because you have the sacred within you. You have God within you. That's what's important. That's what. That's what this is about. The question is, is that if you do tell your story and somebody doesn't accept it or makes fun of it, hurts you because of it. For about the last 25 years, I've asked all my students in politics classes, sociology classes, or religion classes to write a paper telling their story. Those papers are incredible. I mean, those are the best papers I have ever gotten. Because what they do is, first of all, they release what's been inside of them for years that they never did. And when they're done writing the paper, they feel so good knowing that nobody's going to hurt them. And so I think that if you find a friend, someone who cares about you, and you tell that story, what they'll do when you're done with the story is they'll hug you because they'll say, I love you even more now because now I know what you went through. And it made you who you are, all those experiences. So, so what became neg began as negative now becomes something which is positive in terms of transformation. So, and we have the power to do that. So again, please feel free especially with somebody you, who 
who cares about you, to tell the story. It releases it. Telling the story means putting into words the hurt, naming it. And that's the beginning of that vomiting, to vomit it out, to get rid of it. Why? Because it's been poisoning us for years, and to let it go. And then you'll feel so free. Like in Nothing But a Man, Duff comes back and he hugs his wife, and he says, I have never felt so free. Because he finally was able to break with his own father, who had been not a good father. And he was able also to break away from the whites who were, who were threatening him. And he came back, and he said, I'm going to make myself some trouble in this town. And then he said, I have never been so free. Beautiful stories. Beautiful stories. The question is, well, then how, why do we need to be our own Christ or our own Allah or our own Moses? This is because most of us were raised to believe that we are just little people, that we are not important, and that we have to be the followers all the time, that we have to be the disciples. No. I think that what God wants each of us to do is to become a co-creator, a co-creator with God. And there was a marvelous man in the 13th century. His name was Master Eckhart, and this is what he, he they said. He wanted to tell somebody, he said, well, what is God like? And this is what he said, that God lays on a maternity bed all day long giving birth. Oh, wow, that's incredible, because what is he saying? Is that God is a woman, and that God continues to create. It's not over. And so, as we sit here, you know, we're, we're spinning through space right now, right? We're on Spaceship Earth. We're in this huge cosmos in which there are billions of stars, billions of planets, and that the universe is expanding faster than what we thought. Right? We are co-creators of this cosmos. That means to me again that we are not just followers, we're not just disciples, we are co-creators, why? Because we are another face of God. Thank you, Dr. Avalos. It's our pleasure having you here and joining us for Hispanic Heritage Day. Thank you all, thank you.